Thanks, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is our, our sixth UX Oxford Speaker Series talk. Um, just want to say um, a, a big thanks to White October for having us, uh, and thanks to Bunnyfoot for, for sponsoring the beers. Um, and also thanks for coming from, from Mariana, wherever she is, um, and uh, Kathy and myself, Al Power. And if you guys have any interesting UX projects you're working on, or you've got an idea for a talk you think might be suitable, come up and grab one of us and, um, and have a chat, and we'll add you onto our list of, of, of possible speakers. Um, so, um, I'd like to introduce Gary Copley, a good friend of mine. He's um, in a gentle. Be gentle, I think. I, I won't say this, but I'm going to hear that. Um, in, in, a, in a past life, he's been, uh, past roles, he's been a user experience designer at Pearson. He's been a web developer at Torchbox. Uh, and currently, he is the head of online at the, at the Well and Dolphin Conservation Society. Um, and Garrett is a front end developer with over 10 years' experience in developing web based projects for corporate, local government, and charitable clients. Um, his many skills include UX design, community development, information architecture, stand and standards based web development. Garrett's going to be talking about rebuilding from the ground up. Um, he's been helping the WDCS rebuild their web presence and put the supporters and contributors back into the heart of everything they do online. And also helping to build systems that staff can actually use on the app. Um, so I'd like to hand you over to Garrett and please join me. In the Um, so this isn't going to be a standard UX talk, this is um, more of a story about what we've been doing at WPCS over the past year. Um, there's some UX stuff in it, there's some pictures of post-it notes, there are more pictures of animals in it though, so um, you know, hopefully you'll be able to take something away from it. Um, so basically what I'm going to talk about is the situation that WPCS found itself in up until this point, because we haven't actually launched yet. Um, what we did to rectify that situation and possibly give you a few hints to some future plans. So, a little bit of history about us. Um, WDCS was founded in 1987 by a guy called Kieran Mulvaney, who was 16 years old at the time. Um, he set up the organisation as a way of publishing um, research on whales and dolphins. We became a registered charity in 1992. Uh, we do fundraising, we do campaigning, we do policy work, uh, we do research. We do quite, we have quite a few streams to our button. Um, we're a worldwide organisation. Um, we became a non-profit in Germany in 1999 and in Australia in 2003. Uh, we have offices here in England, in Scotland, uh, on the east coast of the US, in Argentina, in Germany and in Australia. And we have scientists working in the Pacific Islands and sometimes in the Caribbean. So one of our offices is in this place, Plymouth, in Massachusetts. Um, we founded here in 2006 uh, when we merged with the Well Adoption Project. Um, this is my favourite place in the world because when I, I go to visit, I get to do this and study humpbacks. Um, now, we also have, like I mentioned, a presence in Scotland. This is Spain Bay on the Moray Firth, um, an absolutely stunning part of the country. Uh, this is our bit here, it's our dolphin centre. Um, I urge you to go because you get to see these guys. Uh, this is a I think she is Kessler, and that's uh, one of her calves. I didn't take this picture though, um, I'm not going to claim credit for that. That was taken by a guy called Charlie Phillips, who does work for us up there. So, the current incarnation of the WDCS website is around about seven years old, um, and there are a few issues with it, and I'll, I'll start to go through them now. But, in a, a, a kind of brief preface, it's all built on a custom CMS, or the bulk of it is built on a custom CMS, so we have no forward support. Um, we also have a problem that we have multiple designs. Um, this is one part of our site, this is another part of our site. Um, so it's huge. Um, I tried to do a content inventory and get up when I got to about a thousand lines in the spreadsheet. Um, just wasn't a very effective use of my time. It actually took me 10 minutes to find this page, I knew it was on the site somewhere. And I've been working on it for a year, and it, I, I, I nearly cried. Um, we also, because we're an international organisation, we have multiple sites for different regions. So this is our German site, which still currently exhibits the design previous to the current design that we've got. Uh, we also have a site for Latin America, and again, completely different design. So 
what we've got here is we have a massive sprawl of sites, no interconnectedness between them, we've got duplication of content, um, and when that happens with some of these sites, they're getting left behind, and effectively what they're getting is a second class experience. As if that wasn't enough, we also have multiple blogs. Um, these are all running on a completely separate engine. They're all, we have four, I think. Uh, we've got one for the uh, research staff, one for the field staff, one for the dolphin project, one for the well adoption project. And again, they are all in their own silos. This has led to more duplication of content. Charlie writes a very uh, compelling blog about the dolphins up in Spay Bay. But as an organisation, one of the ways we run money is you can adopt a dolphin, or you can adopt a humpback, or you can adopt an, uh, an orca. Because those products are available in Germany, what the German staff have had to do is they've been taking Charlie's blog posts in English, copying and pasting them into the German blog, and translating them. So we now have two streams of content that are effectively exactly the same, but there's no linkage between them. The site doesn't know about them, um, the staff don't know about them. Uh, yet again, another piece of design, this is our species guide. This is um, one of the most highly trafficked parts on our site right now. Um, and it, uh, comes up, if you search Google for species guide, we come up number one. That's despite the way this has been built with nested frame sets and fixed width divs and all that sort of stuff. And the fact that I've mentioned that it comes up number one, if you try it now, it probably won't. But, um, yeah. And again, this is fixed width, it's broke, completely broken on small screens, and it's one of those pieces of content where you think, actually, if you're out in the field, whether you're a scientist or a supporter and you want to try and ID something, you're not going to have your laptop with you, you'll have a mobile device with you. So that's the mess, and I like to go back to this quote, and I can't remember where this came from. I think it might have been one of my colleagues from evolve.org, but if anyone knows where that came from, please let me know. Um, so we've got this custom CMS with no ongoing development, uh, massively duplicated content, all siloed, doesn't talk to each other. Um, I tried to do this content audit, gave up, uh, nearly broke down in tears a few times. So, sat down with the senior management team and we basically decided we were going to raise the whole thing to the ground. We were going to start completely from scratch. We would keep some piece of historical content, so for all our blogs and all our news ar archives. We are going to keep all of those, but we are going to start again from the beginning. Now, that's a big ask for an organisation, but luckily I had to support the senior management team, they were quite happy to do it. So the First thing we had to do was work out, right, okay, what are we going to build? And there's two parts to this. There's the content producers, the staff, the scientists, and there's also our supporters, potential supporters, and a bigger audience. So the first thing we did was I ran some staff workshops to get an idea of what the staff felt about the current site and what it could be. So I ran 13 workshops over nine weeks. Uh, it involved trips to Scotland, Germany, and North America. At this point, you're thinking I have the best job in the world. I do. Um, we worked just around a whole series of post it note exercises. And if you've read Game Storming, the whole post up exercise idea, you start off with a question. And the question for all the teams was imagine the most amazing WBCS website you can. And I sat them down with posties and post it notes and sharpies. And after that, we did some affinity mapping and we clustered all the stuff together. This is the result from the Scottish office. Um, there's a little empty gap here for cafe, because they've got a cafe and no one actually wrote anything down about it, but they wanted me to make a note of the fact they had a cafe. One of the advantages of doing this was, because I was doing it across all the different departments, was I got to see common threads coming out of the research. Um, something that maybe different departments weren't talking to each other about, but because I was coming in from the outside um, and had a, a, a new perspective on things, I could see these threads to come together. So, I make no apologies for using a word cloud, and they're cliche, but they, you know, they do work. Um, so I took all the results of those post-up exercises, <coughs> transcribed them, and stuck them into uh, Word and to come up with this, to get an idea of where people were going. I had to write some like, proper reports and stuff as well, but this kind of was the front page of the report I gave to the senior management team. And the big words are easy, supporters, clear, integration. So, it started to give people an idea of, oh, okay, these are things that everyone wants. And there were, you know, there were other themes in there. The current site, excuse me, uh, the current site was too difficult to navigate. Even them of stuff who'd worked there for years couldn't find stuff. That meant that content was getting duplicated, content was getting repeated, it was getting lost. Um, it was just, it was a, a bit of a mess. And there were some other issues that came up, uh, lack of editorial control, 
um, not knowing if a piece of research was actually up to date or if it had been superseded by something else. So that was the staff. So then the next section to look at were our supporters and the general public. So this first question is very, very important. Um, I'll come on to this second bit in a minute, but Josh asked, you know, who are your customers? What do you do for them? Now, our audience has many facets. We have um, people who just love animals. We have um, enthusiastic amateurs, conservationists, students, science professionals, policy writers, governmental organisations, even other charities and um, conservation organisations. So, to answer that first question, is that how the hell do you appeal to that whole audience? Can, is that even doable? What we decided to do is we're going to concentrate on just the supporters. The theory being that if we get it right for them, then we've got a good chance of capturing a broader audience. And we, later phases are going to look at these other facets, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So we have um, an incredible sport relations team who are basically on the phone and answering emails all day, and they talk to people about the animals, they talk to people about the issues that are affecting the animals. Um, and I went down to their office one day and I said, I need some volunteers for some research. If you can't get volunteers, just make people come and see you. So we've had some volunteers, and we put them through some card sort exercises and some so just general question and answer surveys. Now, I had a rough idea in my head of how we could fix this issue, but I wanted to be able to go back to the rest of the organisation and say, this is backed up with data. Um, so we ran our first round of card sorts, and one of the things that came out of that was that the labels we were using were very confusing. Um, internally in the organisation, we will use terms like campaign, project, um, issue, a few other words, and we kind of use them interchangeably, depending on who you're talking to. Are you talking to a policy writer, or are you talking to a scientist, or are you talking to the campaign team? The general public found this really confusing, so we went back, did a second round of card sorts with a much clearer um, bunch of uh, items, and categories started to come out of it. And luckily, these categories kind of mapped to what I was thinking in my head as well. So we started to see this tendency to a very um, narrow but deep version of the site. People were mainly interested in what are the issues affecting the animals, what are we doing about it, and how they can help. And I think that's good, that's a good narrative backbone to put to a site like us. Um, so, and there's some funny, like, people were labelling some of these things like about our awesomeness. There was one up here that was, I think, what did someone call it? How do I part with my money? Um, so we can't use labels like that because we've got to do a multilingual site and that three words is about that one in German, so um, we couldn't do that. So there we are, we've worked out we've got a problem, we've decided to start from scratch, now we've got an idea of what we're actually going to build, which is we're going to build a site that is multilingual, that takes people on this narrative about the animals. So the next phase is what do we do with it? So going back to Josh Clark's quote, um, I've highlighted this emphasis here of mine, this idea of um, giving people the information wherever they need it. So I'm going to take a little step back now because there's a fundamental shift that's been happening on the web over the past couple of years and it's, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I'm going to show you a few slides now that aren't mine. Uh, they're by a guy called Brad Frost who works for RGA in New York. Uh, he's one of their senior mobile designers. And he came up with these three slides that just beautifully encapsulate the issue. And if you're not scared after seeing these three slides, um, you should be, or you might be drunk. Um, the issue is that this is no longer the web. This is the web today. And I'm just going to reel off some numbers for you now. So a third of global internet users access the internet only via mobile. There was a study published last week, um, and I'm trying to recall these numbers from memory, but it was something like 45% of people in the US now only access the web via mobile. For them, using the web on desktop doesn't exist. Um, there are close to one and a half billion people using a computer worldwide, but there are over four billion on the planet who have or have access to a mobile device. 
and if those numbers aren't scary enough, between um, iOS, Android, WebOS, Windows Phone, there are over 200 different device screens and pixel densities. Um, so, this could be where we're going, and this is probably where we are going, and I still want an internet fridge. So the, the issue becomes, how do you even begin to design for this maelstrom of devices that are going to be coming down the road? And for us, it was, we start with the content. And you've probably heard this if you read Alyssa Parr or um, follow any of the like, uh, mobile first guys on Twitter like people do, Steve. You start from the content and you design outwards. Um, so for us, the content revolves around this idea of a narration across the site that it's about the issues, what we're doing, how you can help. And how you can help is not just about money, although that's very important. Um, it's also for us, it's also about creating ambassadors. It's about raising the level of conversation around the issues that affect these animals. We want to kind of bring the level of discourse up. Um, and one of the ways we, we do that and is to structure our content is um, we want to try and cut out the redundancy. We want to make sure that on the site, everything we have is canonical, that there is just one entry for a piece of research, that there is just one entry for whaling. We can bring other bits of content around that, but we need to know that those bits of content we bring in, in themselves, are just unique atoms. Um, Ethan Marker, who wrote the book Responsive Web Design, um, he came up with this great line. He said, we should be building networks of content, not of pages. Design is now the relationship between individual components, not rigid pages. Um, there's a great study on uh, that NPR did um, about their internal system. Uh, they call it Coke, create one to publish everywhere. They built this whole publishing system. So one piece of content goes in that can be expressed in multiple ways. But they know if they edit that one piece of content, it's going to change wherever it appears. Now, most content management systems do this. We're building in Drupal 7, but you know, WordPress can do it. Um, any kind of decent CMS worth its salt can do this sort of stuff. So basically what we did was we set up rigid parameters for content and structure for content. So this is the edit screen for what we call an issue page. So our site is divided into content types. Um, we have uh, an, an issue, a piece of work, a blog post, an event. Each of those pieces of content has some commonality in its fields, but it also has some unique requirements. One of the things we wanted to do for the issues was we wanted to make sure that if people were just arriving at the site via a link from a news organisation or they just done a search, that if they just skimmed the site, they could get a good idea of that particular issue. So we broke out a synopsis, which was a paragraph. No formatting. I sat down with the content editors and said to them, if you need bold italics to make your point, you need to rewrite it. That should stand on its own. Um, we also came up with this idea of talking points, which I kind of call the elevator pitch, which is just five bullet points. Um, and this is kind of how this page now expresses itself. It's the first time I've done transition in the presentation. Um, so you can see how the site is now put together, so we've got the main content. On the left hand side here we have all these things like the FAQs and the in-depth articles. These don't, aren't part of this page, you create references to them. So we know now if research on what's happening in Iceland is doing with whaling, um, if we edit that, we know wherever that piece of content is expressed, it is going to update. It cuts out the redundancy, it means that we can have confidence in the content that we're generating. Um, and again, see on the left we've got these talking points, and then the synopsis sits at the top. Um, so the next phase is when we have confidence in our content, so then how do we get that out there? And going back to Josh's quote from earlier, it's like how you can provide your service or information wherever people need it. And Brad Frost, the guy I talked about earlier, who graciously allows people like me to use the slides, um, had this great quote about content being fluid that it's like water, um, that it fills up the container. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, but not in a technical way, about responsive design, because this is the approach we took. We knew if we've got all this great content that we've now structured, we need containers to pull that into, but those containers have to adapt, because with over 200 device profiles out there, and many more coming down the line, how the hell are we going to cope if we're talking about fixed width or adaptive designs or anything like that? So I'm not going to talk too much about the technicalities, but if you have any questions, grab me and I will happily talk your ear off about it. Um, what I will say is, 
by Ethan Market's book, Responsive Web Design, and also by Adaptive Web Design by Aaron Gustafsson. Um, and I've, I've got a whole bunch of links later that I, I'll give to you guys. But what I want to show you is some of the effects of design inside this way. Um, so this happened. I was stuck on a train outside Big Cop, as normally happens. I was bored, and I just thought, I wonder. So I logged onto my dev server, and it worked. I didn't design for this. The content adapted itself and just fell into the Kindle and worked. Um, I also do a lot of guerrilla user testing in the pub, whenever I'm out with friends. If they've got a device that I haven't used before, I will grab their phone and I will test it and see how it looks. So this is uh, my friend Duncan's um, Samsung, and it just worked. I haven't actually tested on an Android device at this point, but it worked. I was very, very happy. Um, and yeah, and again, then on to the, the wider screen devices. Um, one of the things about responsive design is you have to think about things not the way you normally would. You start with the mobile context and you unlinearize your content, if that's even a word. But start with the simple use case and then expand on it. Um, it's incredibly difficult. It caused me a lot of late nights. Um, it's still not perfect. We still have some problems with the way we're handling images. But it's worth it, and given the proliferation of devices, you're going to want to have this technique in your toolbox. Um, it's, um, it's great. It's one of those real kind of uh, montage moments when, you, when it all works properly. Um, so I'm just going to end this section with um, this quote that, uh, I, from Erin's book, which this is a brilliant book that you should buy, because um, she talks about P a lot. Um, but what she's referring to here is the, um, is the idea that we are biological creatures. And that means that we have to make allowances for the hundreds of distractions and disabilities that cross our path every single day. You'll hear, and I've, I was just guilty of it 30 seconds ago, you'll hear lots of people talking about mobile versus desktop, but it's not that anymore. I mean, these mobile devices we now have are more powerful than desktops. They've got GPS, they have accelerometers, they have three axis gyroscopes. They have a sense of time and place that desktops can't possibly have. So you have to start thinking about context. Um, what could the person possibly be want, to, want to be doing with your content or your application at the point they're using it? The problem is trying to work out context is very difficult. There isn't an API for it, you don't know what people are doing. But this is where user research comes in and where the content you're delivering comes in. Um, one example is our new version of the Species Guide will be a mobile app, but it will be a web-based app. So if you're browsing on a small screen device, it will download all the pages from the Species Guide in the background, so it's sitting there on your device. So next time you're up at the Moray Fur, or if you're over in Plymouth, or if you're down in Argentina, you will have a Species Guide that runs offline on your phone. So now that we've got this platform that's nearly finished, um, I'm just going to take you through a few things that we're going to be doing in the future. Um, and this is also an excuse to show you some nice photographs. Uh, so you know you can sit back and relax. Um, so one of the, the next things I'm going to be doing is putting geodata throughout the site. And the reason being that we can um, come up with some really compelling visualizations and ways of grabbing an audience if we have a sense of time and place about. Um, what we're presenting. So uh, one of the ideas is, in the current species guide, the animals have distribution. So some, some animals live in the Arctic, some of them in the North Pacific, some of the North Atlantic. That current distribution map on our species guide is just a static GIF. There's information locked up in that static GIF that a machine can't understand. What I want to do is I want to break that out of there and actually use geodata to plot that distribution map. Because then what we can do, when something happens in the news, like um, or foil disaster or uh, a whaling fleet in Japan, we can geotag that news article and then we can present a view of the world that shows where these animals are and the threats that they are facing at that point. So that's, you know, that's one thing we want to do. Um, this, uh, this is our US team. Um, live sighting notifications. So at the minute, if you come on to WBCS, you can adopt a dolphin, you can adopt a whale, you'll get a newsletter every couple of months. I want to stick to the point when these guys are out in the water and they spot one of the humpbacks, they can just fire up their phone and say, boom. And the phone knows who they are because they're logged in. Um, it knows where they are because it's got GPS. And they just need to pick from a list of the adoptable whales and say, I've just seen salt done. 
that talks to our CRM system, which then pulls a list of people who've adopted salt out of the system and sends them an email there and then saying, hey, your whale has just been seen in these coordinates. Come back to whales.org and see some photographs in half an hour. Um, virtual whale watches. Uh, this boat looks really full, by the way. Guarantee there is no one on the other side of that boat. Um, but when we're out in the water, we're taking about four or five gig of photographs and two, three hours of footage a day. And that all goes, that all has you know, valid scientific use. But what I would love to do is to take edited highlights from that, bundle it into a KML file that people could download, and then they can have a virtual whale watch sitting at their computer. Because when we're out, we don't just see the animals, um, we also see um, you know, incidents of marine debris, we see pollution, we see other animals, we see, I mean, specifically out here, um, we see basking sharks, dolphins, um, sunfish, all that sort of stuff. So that's another thing I want to do using rich media in that way. Um, and then another, again, this photograph has nothing to do with what I'm about to tell you, but we're sitting on a lot of data. We've been around since the mid-80s. Um, we've got sightings data that goes back to the early 90s in the US. Not all of it is digitized yet, but is there an avenue for us to do something like Galaxy or Old Weather? Is there something there where we could build a platform for citizen science experiments? But well, this little guy here, that's a sand lance, that's what I'm back to. He's the luckiest guy in the world because he's just about to escape. Um, so that's kind of some of the places we can go with the platform we're building. And if you have any ideas, please let me know and you will get full credit. Um, so that's it. So um, if you have any questions, stick your actual thing up. Um, I have bundled a whole bunch of links together on Pinboard, uh, tagged with the Oxford 2012. Pinboard URLs are really obtuse. Uh, I will tweet this later on and I'll get the UX Oxford guys to retweet it. And there's links in there to some of the articles I've talked about, some of the responsive design techniques, content first, mobile first, and that sort of thing. So <coughs> we'll stick the um, that link up on our site yep. along with the uh, talk info. And yep. so I'm done. Ask away. You talked about um, making the site. <coughs> Um, more relevant for, you, for people who are going to be using it. Did you actually do much consumer research, focus group campaigns? We did a lot of stuff with our support relations team, with our existing supporters. We did a little bit of outreach to potential supporters. But the thing is, that's such a big possible catchment area. And it's very difficult to ask questions. Because if you, how do you do a study and you say to people, would you like to save whales? And everyone will go, yes. <laughs> um, so it's basically what we've done with this phase is we're concentrating on our existing supporters. Um, again, I mean, like I say, our demographics are going from a 10 year old kid who loves dolphins through to a 90 year old academic who's been with us. We have really, really great retention rates with our supporters. Um, we've got some people that have been with us for 20 years. Um, so we've made a conscious decision just to concentrate on the existing supporters and hopefully get a bit more catchment around the fact that the site's going to be better to navigate. It's going to be better indexed. It's all actually going to be under one roof as opposed to siloed across so five or six different sites. Did you then look at the popular areas of the site? Um, yeah, we, we did. Yeah, I mean, we did some we did some analytics stuff. The problem is our analytics aren't well, haven't been brilliant because we've got so many different sites. What would happen is that a news article would be posted to the North American site. It would then get copied across to the international site and the UK site. So then effectively what you've got is you have three articles in the same place. Trying to do the metrics on that is a little bit tricky. I mean, we, we've got really good data about species though, because only one of those exists, and we know how highly traffic that is. Um, we've got really crap bounce rates at the minute, um, really crap time on site for people who do actually stay on the site. So we're taking a bit of a punt, basically, but to be honest, um, we're not going to put ourselves in a worse situation. <laughs> so you mentioned that you did um, workshops with current um, staff at the board. Uh, the, uh, have you done any testing with users, so uh, actual supporters and the children and the elderly people? And yeah, we've done a little bit of um, what I call gorilla testing. So I did a, um, when we did the um, the supporter stuff. So as well as doing the card sorts, we also did some surveys. And the questions were very similar to, to the general kind of 
what's rubbish about the site, what would you like to see us do, um, pick five words. I mean, some of it was a bit floaty, but it was just to kind of try and get an idea. As we were coming up with this idea of structured content and this narrative to the site, I did some paper prototyping with people that had nothing to do with the organisation, who, who were friends of mine but didn't really know the area, just to see if we were on the right track. Because one of the things we wanted to do was to move very quickly for this. But yeah, the other thing, as well as doing all this, we're undergoing a rebranding exercise. So um, that results of that coming out in the next couple of weeks. So I then have to take, well that design that you saw is a temporary one, I then have to take the results of the branding exercise and build a new skin for the site. So because we had all these things going on in parallel, we're, it's not the ideal situation. We probably would have loved to have done a lot more research, but through my experience of working at Torchbox and previous to Torchbox working for other like, non-profits and things like that, there's kind of a core that non-profit campaigning sites always have. And right now, I just want to get us to that point where that core is built. And we'll carry on. I mean, we're, we're building an Agile, so we're doing sprints, and we have a massive backlog for all the workshops. Um, so we're just trying to get that core done first. And a lot of it, we're kind of flying with that instinct. Two questions. Uh, how, how have you did some research with the staff initially, and then some with, with users? Ooh. How close did you find those two knitting together, or were they completely different? And my second question is, um, <laughs> When you did your research and, and uh, workshops with your staff, you obviously had lots of different departments with organisations spread around the global place, all with different demands and needs. How did you um, manage um, you know, stakeholder uh, wants and needs across the whole company when you've got different departments all wanting their stuff first? Uh, all right, I'll answer the second one first. So um, I'm lucky enough to report directly to the CEO. So there, to answer the second part, there was a lot of selective deafness on my part. But one of the things I did do was I went around all the departments and explained the Agile process and said, look, what we're doing in these workshops is getting all the ideas down. I'm not saying you're going to get all of this and you're probably not going to get 90% of it. But what I want to find out is what's common, what's the core that we're trying to build. These other pieces are not going to be forgotten. Um, I, the original version I did of this talk, I was going to go into some of the tools I'm using. Um, but then I thought I'd put two pictures of Wales up because they looked cooler. Um, one of the things I'm doing is using Pivotal Tracker a lot. And um, right now it's only myself and the CEO have access to Pivotal Tracker because we're building the sprints and working out what the priorities are. But once we get phase one launch, we're going to open up more accounts to the rest of the staff so they can see that everything that they did in the workshops has been captured. And then it will just be a matter of, and it's going to be a continual process of everyone wants to have their pony but you can't all have your pony at the same time, so let's kind of take it in steps. So the geodata thing is something that I'm very, very keen to get into the site, because I think that's going to completely revolutionise how we can get out to an audience. Can't remember the first question. Um, how closely were the uh, Oh, the user the, the, the staff resources. Very, very close. Um, it mainly revolved around the idea of the site's too big, we can't find anything, it's not getting across the WDCS call, um, values and, and you know, our, our aim and what we're trying to do. Um, there were a few kind of like little outlier bits, but nothing really comes to mind right now. But on the whole, it all kind of was very, very close. Um, yeah, one thing I did skip over, I meant to mention it during the talk, is the, um, I don't know if you've been following what uh, gov.uk have been doing, the government digital services. Um, a couple of weeks ago, they published their design principles. And design principle number one is, Everything has to come from a need. It's called asterisk, and it says user needs, not government needs. And that was basically a massive validation for what I was doing when they published that, because that's pretty much what I said to the guys in the office. I said, look, so far, so good. Your needs and the user needs are matching up quite well, but at the point where there's friction, the users are going to come first, because that's my role, is to be the user advocate for the organisation. Um, so yeah, how how do we? Um, I think we'll how, quite a bit of it. Yeah. 
how do we stop people kind of concentrating on uh, personal preferences as opposed to yeah. what the research is saying? Um, it helps if you report directly to the CEO. That's true. Um, the other thing is, this site still doesn't have a design. The first bit of the site that when we started building, when I started building it, um, I dropped in a quick style sheet that had some nice typography in it and had some layout. So there was no colour there for people to start going, oh, I think that should be a different shade of blue or that sort of thing. It was basically, it was a, an interactive wireframe. It was, a, it was a part wireframe, part prototype, but it was actually the site starting to be built. So I was getting them to concentrate on the words. And you know, bits came through like, oh, well, why can't we put bold in the synopsis? And so well, if you need bold to make your point, go away and rewrite it. You don't know what device it's going to turn up on. That device might not have a font that has a bold in it. So um, it's tricky. I mean, yeah, not everyone's in my position. If you can back it up with research, and it's quite handy, um, I don't know what the equivalent would be on Windows, but on a Mac, uh, it's a program called Silverback that Clearleft came out with uh, for Gorilla Use Testing. If you've got something like that, test your fit. You'll either get the results you want, in which case you can go back to the client and you can say, look, I know you think that this is a good, valid reason for doing this, however, five people have tested it on say, no. Or we will find out that your thing you're testing isn't working, in which case you still won, because then you go away and come up with another idea. And it helps not being able to sign, basically. Yeah. Yes. Were you able to include social um, media in terms of the rules set up, so YouTube channels, Facebook, is that all part of the work you did? Yeah, I mean, we've got um, the, uh, the person who runs our kind of social networking stuff, uh, Sue, who's one of the guys out in the US, she's doing a fantastic job. She basically looks after our Facebook page and our Twitter account. Um, and we have a YouTube account and we have a video account as well. So, one of the things we're doing is we're not hosting anything ourselves, we can help it. Um, so, any videos we do, I mean, and this was one of the things I explained to them is, yes, it's all well and good that you, know, you want to host our own videos, but it takes a massive amount of infrastructure and someone's already solved that problem. Also, we benefit by having our media on other sites. So, people who may come across our video on YouTube will then follow a link back to the site. It's all, our principle going forward is that the site is the place where the content lives. We express that content in different ways on different networks, but we will always want to bring people back to the site because we're the authoritative voice about that. You know, we can't control YouTube comments. Um, we can't control video comments or anything like that. So yes, <coughs> everything will be externally hosted and we will then put it into the site. But um, we're just trying to maintain a bit of control over the conversation because it's a very, very tricky subject. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very politically charged subject. So the, the blogs that you're curr you've currently got around the place, are they all now part of the main site? Yeah, um, it took me two weeks to write the code um, and we now have, I think it's something in the region of 3,000 archive blog posts now sitting at the site. Uh, we have two and a half thousand news articles. Uh, while we were doing this like, search for um, news, because we've not only have we got the news on the main site, or, uh, the main site as is, but the German team also publishing their own news in German. Oh yeah, by the way, this site is in three languages as well. It's multilingual. Um, that was good. Um, and we also have the Argentinian guys publishing in uh, Spanish for the Latin America. So we, when we pulled in all of those art news articles. <laughs> What we also did, we found a whole bunch of news articles sitting on the server in a Lotus Notes file that went back to uh, 1990, they covered the period from 95 to 2000. It's a whole bunch, five years worth of news articles that had been from a way old version of the site that they just hadn't migrated into the, new, into the current site. And they were like, well, we can publish these now. I said, yeah, we can publish these now. These are all, so we have a new news archive going back. Back to and do you need to worry about, or, or maybe do the, do the writers on those blogs, do they need to worry about any corporate, any, um, any brand, um, style guys, or any line terms, or line or, or do, they, are they, do they feel they've had any sort of autonomy to move by bringing everything? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question because it's kind of a double edged sword because these blogs have been out there kind of siloed away from everything else, and it's like the field work teams 
have been separate from the adoption project team as far as content is concerned. So yeah, one of the issues is, are they going to be able to maintain their own sense of identity of what they're talking about? But way against that is, they've been out there for so long, it's like they don't get that much traffic anymore. Um, we made a, a decision that there wasn't going to be any editorial controls on the blogs. You know, we're not a big organisation. I think we're 70 ish people worldwide, not including interns who come and um, work for scientists. We made a distinction between news articles and blog posts. News articles are kind of the official voice of WDCS, and that's what our PR guys will be publishing. But blog posts, we trust the people in the organisation, they know what they're talking about. You know, half the scientists I don't understand what they're saying, because they're off there at a much higher plane of knowledge than I am. But um, I know the way they're saying it's effective. They are communicating to their audience. So, you know, there's yeah, and there's some kind of navigation and structural issues about it's like how do people find Charlie's blog? You know, Charlie's blog isn't all about the dolphins up in Spain, but so we need to make sure people can find that who have adopted a dolphin and it's mainly um, the it's a little bit of research, it's quite old though, but um, yeah, mainly people that read Charlie's blog are people who've been up there and visited him or have adopted dolphins. And then you've also got people like our science team who are writing very high level articles about what happened at the International Whaling Commission or other conferences. Um, so we're trying to work out a way, and that's, that's an ongoing issue, we still need to work out how we can do that. I think what we're, I mean, we're going to have lots of redirects from the old site to the new site. Um, but we're just going to have to try and make sure that however we express the teasers to these different blogs, we do it effectively. So if you're on the Adopted Dolphin page, if you're on the page for, you know, if you want to adopt a dolphin, the link is there so you can go over to Charlie's blog and read it. Right? So I haven't heard any complaints about people you know, saying, you know, oh, we're all part of one big mess now. Um, but they might, that might happen. And if it does, that's something I'll have to deal with. Select the distance. <laughs> Um, you talk about kind of lots of different sites all over the place kind of coming into one. And yeah, probably having kind of the area of CEO is probably a big part of this, but how do you get to buy in for that? Because I mean, especially for the blogs, kind of uh, they've got their owners who obviously feel so protected over them. How do you go and let like, they see they can say come over here? Um, the, the benefits far outweigh um, what they were currently putting up with. Um, the the blogging engine that was being used I'm not going to name it, but I've never heard of it before. Um, I took one look at the admin area and thought I'd gone back to the 90s. Um, everyone, as far as I can tell, hated it. It had no effective spam prevention or anything like that. Um, one, of the, one of the other things we did, which was kind of a, a teaser, and once this video is out, everyone's watching it, they'll know what I did now. Um, our internet currently runs on SharePoint. And as I describe it, SharePoint is the place where documents go to die. So what I did was I did a very quick install of Atrium, which is a, a Drupal package. Basically, it's, in, it's an internet in a box. But what that did was, people started using it, and they got used to how Drupal works as far as content editing goes, and how its WYSIWYG editor works, and how content is structured, and that sort of thing. So when we started to seed out the site during alpha testing, people logged in and went, ooh, like that girl, um, Jurassic Park, which sits down in front of the SGI thing, it's all the Unix, I know this. They sat down in front of this thing and they went, oh, I've got this. I know how this works. So it's kind of a, um, an element of pushing and uh, an element of, look how shiny this thing is, look what it can do, look, you don't have to worry about spam anymore, you know, it automatically formats stuff, look, it works on different screen sizes. And what's that the same experience for the international sites? Yeah, uh, especially with the international sites, because they've been kind of, not on purpose, but just because the web team is very small. Um, because they've been left behind with the, the last phase of development, and they couldn't get any features built. When you're sitting on a custom CMS, and the guy who built it no longer works for the organization, what do you do? You know, they, they, they were hobbling along, but it was the right time to basically say, let's start again. You know, let's start with something. Let's take advantage of the last 15 years of web development and web technology and actually build something that's going to be a platform. That's the way I describe it, it's like putting a Lego set together, you know, we're putting the blocks in place now. This is kind of a difficult bit. The cool stuff is going to come much later. Um, you said you've got researchers who are posting like high level blogs and you've got people who are coming to the site who perhaps just need persuading to donate or... Yeah. or 
um, sort of get involved financially. How do you get the right people to the right places? Um, so phase one is concentrating on the supporters, but there is a definite need because of our, our audience. There is a massive need to be able to talk to those kind of people. You know, to the attendees of the international writing conference, to research students who want to come and research with us to write papers, that sort of thing. The way we've done it right now is that the, the main landing pages for the issues and for our work are written at a very clear level. And, and this, was, this is an ongoing discussion in the organisation as well, because the science teams see it as possibly dumbing down. What we're saying is, no, we're trying to, be, trying to clarify something. We're trying to make this a clear message. This isn't for you guys, this is for people who pay us money to help you guys do what you want to do. The next phase is going to be, it's going to be a big discussion, is do we work out a way of layering in that high level science and research content? Or, as, um, what was her name from Oxfam? Was it Kathy? Kathy. Kathy was talking about Oxfam faced the same issue, about building a separate professional side, where the audience, the expectation of the audience's knowledge level is much higher, and we can then basically say, okay, this is all the stuff that you're looking for, and give them a multifaceted search engine and all that kind of document publishing and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's not an issue we've hit yet. We're thinking about it, and we've kind of got some ideas, and there's some sketches sitting on my desk right now about how possible ways we could do it. But it's not an issue we've tackled yet. We're going to have to. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we haven't tackled it. I'll let you know. I'll come back to that. <laughs> Starting from the ground up, what do you, obviously you've got pre-existing all, all these links out there. What do you do with sort of phasing out old content? Um, we're in the process of building one of the biggest Apache configurations I've ever seen. Um, there's some bits of content that absolutely need to have redirects. Um, the species guide, everything on the species guide needs to hit the right page again because it's being referenced. Um, not only by people doing research, kids doing research and that sort of stuff, but it's, it's linked to by thousands of places out there. So we know that's got to be an issue. We're doing some automatic keyword searching, so when people are linking to blog posts, we have a pretty good idea of what they were trying to link to. Um, when I did the import, I pulled over the original article ID, so there's a little bit of custom code I've written that will make a good approximation of right, but they want that, and we'll throw it on them to it. There are some bits that... Um, because the existing sites are so big and they sprawl so much, so some bits we just can't take care of. It would be ridiculous. So our Apache instances would never boot up if we tried to put every single redirect in there. So you know, there are certain things we know if people are asking for um, wdcs-de.org, they want the German site. So we can switch the site into German for them. We can put them on the front page and we can break apart the path and make a rough guess about what they're looking for. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but given the traffic levels on the site, again, it's one of those things that we're willing to kind of, you know, we will expend the energy on the things that we need to get people to, but apart from that, we're just going to take a pump and let Google come and read the message. Okay. Um, and with responsive design, are you using the group system? Have you got any recommendations about starting from this using the system? I started off prototyping with uh, the adaptive version of 960, uh, which was great, and um, you know this uh, Malarkey's got a good one as well. But it got to the point um, my kind of the scale from the scale from the eyes moment with response to design was um, I bought Mark Bolton's videos um, lectures that he did from Five Simple Steps, and he talked about the idea of um, if you're dealing with old content, one of the things you should base your grid on is that old content. So we have lots of images sitting in the old blogs that are at a certain ratio. Now if I tried to squeeze those into a 960 grid or anything like that, it just wouldn't have felt right. So um, I made the bold gesture and I'm like, screw this, I'm going to make my own grid. Um, and I did, and it really hurt. But it means now that I'm get, coming across these happy accidents. When all the blog posts came in, they looked fine. They just worked. You know, there wasn't any kind of weird alignments or images floating off in weird places. Um, it's still a learning experience for me. Um, I've realised that the the grid that I originally did for the site has an odd number of columns, 
but there are certain places where I really need an even number of columns, especially when we're doing like landing pages for like these are the issues. It's, it all felt a bit off kilter having it too far left or too far right. So I've, I've actually incorporated two grids into the site. There's one that's got an even number of columns and one that's got an odd number of columns. As far as resources, Ethan Markle's book is fantastic. Uh, he's a brilliant writer, he's very funny. Um, he doesn't talk down to you. It's very, very simple the way he lays it all out. Um, and it's still, I mean, it's still very early days for responsive design. There are still some issues with, lots of issues with images and that sort of thing. Um, but by his book, follow him on Twitter. He's a B, BWP. Um, and he also runs a responsive website, Twitter account as well, which I think is just part of what we do. Um, and just start reading and start playing around with it. It's, uh, you know, you can have a grid with two columns, or you can have a grid with 15 columns. Just play around with it and sort of see how you get on. And annoy me on Twitter if you want. I'm going to share some pain. <laughs> Did you pick responsive or adaptive? Responsive. Because um, the figure you can I mean, with, well, when, we started, when I started out with the 960, that was the adaptive version where it just suddenly snapped different columns. Something about it just didn't feel right to me. I wanted it to be a more seamless experience, especially walking around our offices where, um, you know, some people are using Mac, some people are using Windows, some people are using Linux boxes, some people have monitors that are this wide, some people are working on their iPads. And just going around and seeing so many variations, it's like, oh, great, but we're testing. Um, responsive felt better for me. It just, after I learned more about it, it just was a process, it just felt better. We had lots of issues with some responsive images. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you, you, you was there a bit of pain for you, I'm not sure what, what issues you've come into and what you've um, tried to tackle it so far. The biggest issue, the biggest issue we've got right now is I don't have a finished look and feel for the site. So the, that snapshot you saw where it's like synopsis, big banner, and then uh, two columns of text. I don't imagine the banner staying like that because it just looks a bit disjointed. I obviously want to do a bit more overlaying and that sort of thing. Um, but one of the issues I'm finding is with the wider end of the spectrum. Because you've got to try and find that happy medium between, okay, I'm just going to send this size image down the wire. Because I can't work out, you know, there's, there's a few polyfills and there's a few server-side implementations of ways of trying to work out what capabilities the device has as far as bandwidth and screen time, this size go. Right now I'm taking the point of view of I'm going to try and find a happy medium of this will work for now and I can back hold something into it later. So, um, I mean it helps with using Drupal because uh, one of its um, components, you, know, you can do like dynamic image resizing. So you set up a bunch of presets and then when it just someone requests the image it just goes, oh, we want that size. So it's been easy for me to prototype stuff, see how it works, and then try it again. But I think the biggest issue right now is I'm at that point where the content is going in, but I don't quite know if this is going to be the finished design. Mm. It's not going to veer too wildly from it, because everyone so far is quite happy, and the organisation is happy with it. Uh, the sport relations love it, because they, so they get a phone call, someone's all what's happening in Wayland, they could just go to the Wayland page and it's there. Um, so, yeah, it's, there's going to be a, going to need to be more finessing around the images, um, but it's not a solved problem. You know, people way smarter than me, um, who's upon it backside writing, are oh, haven't solved it yet. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of discussion, but it's right now it's just about making some compromises. Yeah, I think the, the image issue is something that's uh, been worked quite a lot. Uh, there's a guy from Matt Marquez who's doing a lot of writing in this, uh, with these. There's a big focus group to do with. Uh, actually, how, how this is going to work with the bandwidth issue. Um, so, yeah, kind of, that's the place to go through this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, so, um, and some of the browser manufacturers are in talks about um, possibly some new APIs to try and work out what the user's connection is. But again, this kind of goes back to what I was talking about is that will give us some context. We won't give you all the context. They might be on the fastest connection as well, but they might be very time poor. They might not have time to wait for this image to download. So, it's kind of that's why I like this idea of just, it's kind of progressive enhancement taken to the absolute maximum, which is to start with the content and then build out from there. I think that's an issue where you can't necessarily do automatic cropping and resizing. You're saying some of your images, you've got long thin, thin images, they're not going to... Oh, but 
yeah, yeah, so so frothing on, right, right. on those is terrible. <clears throat> so um, there's a, we've, got a, we've got an issue page of captivity. We have this fantastically heartbreaking picture of two walkers in captivity. But when, when the system cropped it, it cro cropped it so all you can see is like two chins. That's it. It's like, well, what's that? <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm writing some code to give uh, the editors the, the ability to define the crop. So it, it's a fixed ratio, so I know it will fit, but they'll be able to say, actually, I want you, instead of just picking from the middle and going out, I want you to do the top left hand quick go. And, you know, and sometimes you want to completely swap images and do yeah, a different image as well. I feel like I'm supporting you upload potentially multiple images depending on... Yeah, there's, um, there's been, over the past couple of days, there's been um, a couple of good articles in .NET magazine um, about responsive, uh, building responsive from scratch. Yeah. And um, today's had lots of links to all the different things I've got. Join me in my pain. Mm. Cool. Well, uh, thanks.